Imagine running a railroad so overloaded that engines doubled up, crews stretched to braking, and still the mountains refused to yield. Union Pacific saw a trucking takeover looming and gambled everything on building a new breed of monster locomotive. But what happens when the biggest brute ever made still can't conquer the rails? The answer would detonate an arm race of superpower machines and force engineers to rewrite the rules of railroad might. Freight trains stretched farther than ever before, but the rails buckled under the strain. Union Pacific's answer was raw muscle, the 9,000-class steam locomotive. Twelve massive driving wheels gripped the rails in a single rigid frame, and a third cylinder punched out even more power. On the open plains, these machines thundered along with authority, their long wheelbase soaking up the straight miles. But the West was no endless prairie. When the tracks twisted through Sherman Hill or the Wasatch Mountains, the 9000s fought every curve. Crews braced themselves for the bone-shaking ride. Complaints filled logbooks about the pounding, the extra strain, and the brutal maintenance that came with that awkward third cylinder. Doubleheading became a daily routine, with two or more locomotives locked together to muscle heavy loads up steep grades. Every extra engine meant more fuel burned, more men on the payroll, and more money spent keeping the whole operation running. Meanwhile, trucks on new highways zipped past with smaller loads, but far less hassle. The cost of keeping up was piling high, and the 9000 class, once the pride of the line, was showing its limits. Something had to give, or Union Pacific risked losing the race for America's freight. Inside Union Pacific's Motive Power Department, the search for a breakthrough pushed engineers to their limits. Otto Jobelman's design notebooks from 1935 brimmed with calculations, sketches, and frustration until one page revealed a solution, hinge pin. Split the frame in two joined by a hinge pin, this articulated design let the locomotive bend around mountain curves that had battered the old rigid giants. Four equal-sized cylinders, two for each out-half, worked together through a clever system of steam delivery and balanced rods. The result was that reciprocating mass was slashed, hammer blow on the rails dropped, and speed no longer meant violence. Testing moved from drawing boards to the rails, in March 1936, a prototype thundered out of Ogden, Utah, bound for Green River with a full load. Crew logs from that day call it the smoothest mountain run in memory. No helper engines, no drama, just pure, smooth power. The new engine's 83-square-foot firebox and roller bearings kept steam and motion steady, even at 70 miles an hour. At Green River, inspectors found only minor bearing warmth, nothing close to the breakdowns that plagued the 9,000-class engines. Watching the machine return, Vice President William Jeffers declared, Boys, that is a challenger for anything on the rails. Within a decade, more than a hundred challengers would carry that name, each one a testament to engineering that finally matched the mountains. By early 1942, Union Pacific dispatchers were staring at freight orders that dwarfed anything they had seen before. The war effort demanded raw materials, tanks, munitions, train after train loaded to the roof. On the grades of Sherman Hill and the Wasatch, tonnage reports spiked past 3,600 tons per train. Challenger locomotives, once the pride of the fleet, began to falter under the relentless weight. Dispatch sheets from those winters are peppered with red-inked notations, stalled, awaiting helper, delayed. Crews radioed in for backup as engines spun their wheels on icy rails, and the helper logs filled with extra assignments, sometimes two, even three engines lashed on for a single climb. Every added locomotive meant more fuel, more crew, and more time lost coupling and uncoupling on mountain sidings. Planners in Omaha watched the clock and the costs spiral upward. Wartime urgency left no room for bottlenecks. Challenger's limits were clear in black and white. On the busiest days, the line ground to a crawl, every mile of track a test of muscle and patience. The demand for a new kind of power could no longer be ignored. 
On August 28, 1941, Union Pacific's board authorized the most audacious locomotive order in American rail history, 25 engines, each designed to conquer the mountains alone. The blueprint called for a 488 four-wheel arrangement with four pilot wheels, two sets of eight driving wheels, and four trailing wheels, stretching over 132 feet and tipping the scales at more than 1.2 million pounds. These machines would need to haul 3,600-ton wartime freights up Sherman Hill and the Wasatch without a helper in sight. Alco build sheets laid out the challenge. Four massive cylinders and articulated hinge to bend around mountain curves, a firebox big enough to swallow a room, and roller bearings everywhere to keep the motion smooth. Each locomotive came with a tender holding up to 25,000 gallons of water and more than 32 tons of coal. The first big boy thundered off the production line in late 1941, its sheer presence a statement that Union Pacific would not be outmuscled. Soon, big boys were assigned to the harshest grades, their numbers roaring across Wyoming and Utah, each run a living demonstration of what single-engine power could achieve. For the men in Omaha, the boardroom gamble paid off in steel and steam. Single-unit power became the goal. Early diesel locomotives promised cleaner, more efficient power, but their 1,500 horsepower each could not match the muscle of a big boy or a challenger alone. Union Pacific found itself stringing four, five, sometimes six diesel units together just to move a single heavy freight over the mountains. More engines meant more complexity, multiple crews, tangled control systems, and a maintenance headache every time a unit failed. Procurement teams began to question whether this was progress or just a new kind of problem. GTEL was the answer Union Pacific pursued. Drawing on wartime turbine experiments, they partnered with General Electric to field the world's first gas turbine electric locomotives. The first generation arrived in 1949, each packing 4,500 horsepower, about two-thirds the punch of a big boy, but with far fewer moving parts. Instead of coal or diesel, these machines burned Bunker C, a thick tar-like oil left over from refining. Old steam tenders were converted to insulated heated oil tanks, each holding up to 24,000 gallons to keep the turbines about spinning across the high plains. Big Blow became the nickname for the three-unit turbine units. By 1958, Union Pacific unveiled the ultimate turbine, the three-unit GTEL Big Blow. At 8,500 horsepower and 83 feet long, it was the most powerful locomotive on rails. The turbines thrived at high speed, but at low speeds they guzzled fuel, and as the plastics industry boomed, Bunker C prices soared. Maintenance records show experiments with propane, Cleaner but volatile and expensive, city regulators in Los Angeles and Denver soon banned the big blows for their deafening roar and exhaust, so hot it melted asphalt under overpasses. By 1969, the last GTEL units were retired, often paired with the diesels for backup, leaving behind a legacy of thunder and controversy. Union Pacific's drive for a new mega diesel kicked off a fierce contest among America's locomotive builders. EMD, GE, and Alco all pitched prototypes meant to replace the turbines and outmuscle anything on the rails. The DD35 and the DDA35 rolled out first, towering diesels with two prime movers each, boasting a combined 5,000 horsepower. But shop logs tell the real story electrical fires, truck frame cracks, and a constant churn of warranty claims. GEU-50s, patched together from turbine leftovers, suffered their own string of breakdowns. Overheating, frame failures, even derailments caused by split bolsters. Alco's C855, the largest of the Century line, uh, looked impressive on paper, but broke its own frame in service and was sidelined almost as soon as it arrived. By the mid-1970s, most of these giants were scrapped or parked.
their promise undone by reliability woes, out of the wreckage came a machine that finally delivered on Union Pacific's vision. In 1969, EMD unveiled the DDA-40X, nicknamed the Centennial for the Transcontinental Railroad's 100th anniversary. Stretching 98 feet from nose to tail and packing a staggering 6,600 horsepower, it was the largest and most powerful single-unit diesel ever built. Crews raved about the Centennial's responsiveness. Engineers reported the locomotive could outpace a string of smaller diesels on the flats, and maintenance teams found its modular electronics easier to service after early teething issues. Some units logged over 22,000 miles a month, with several surpassing 2 million miles before retirement in 1984. After decades of false starts and failures, Union Pacific had its dependable super diesel, one that lived up to the legend of the big boy and the challenger and set a new record for distance traveled by any locomotive class. Today, as freight trains stretch to nearly three miles and automation reshapes railroads, Union Pacific's obsession with power still defines America's supply chain. Every container crossing the plains owes something to those monster machines. The race to move more, faster, never really ended. Only the beasts have changed.